I have to tell you that I really have been, you know, part of what we get to do is really to follow our passions as producers here. We're given a lot of editorial freedom, and we try to bring that best television that we possibly can to television. And when I first met Lydia, I have to say, I have never seen anybody who strikes a chord in people's hearts the way that Lydia does. I think she is kind of everyone's grandmother, their Nona. I think they think of her as their aunt. They think of her as the mother that they wish they had. Um, and I think she is also a very passionate communicator. And I think for a public television audience, one of the things that I think resonates is authenticity. People really know someone who is passionate about cooking, about teaching, about bringing the world to television. It is my privilege to introduce Lydia Bastianich. Ah, buonasera, grazie, grazie. Thank you, Lori. That was really wonderful, Lori. And let me tell you, when you throw that pasta to the wall, if it sticks, it is done. And there's a reason for it too. And that's why I tell you not to put olive oil in the, in the water or to, to rinse the pasta because uh, when it's cooked just right, there's that little bit of starch where the sauce adheres to. So that's, if you throw it to the wall, it sticks. Anyway, it, but if you, if you know, but so don't rinse the pasta and don't put olive oil when you cook the pasta because you don't get that kind of a little bit of stickiness. PBS, I've been only on PBS, and that's a choice that I made uh, at, at the very beginning. How my story begins, it's of course with books and restaurants, and we'll go into that maybe a little later. But uh, uh, as far as television, in when I had my first restaurant, uh, uh, Felidia, my first restaurant in the city, Julia Child, James Beard, all the great sort of foodies would come to the restaurant and wanted to know what this woman was cooking, this regional Italian food, what is it all about? And uh, I became friends with Julia Child, and ultimately she asked me to come on her show. So I did two episodes of her Master Chef series, uh, and one of them was nominated for an Emmy, uh, which we're very proud. But out of that came, of course, uh, um, the producer asking me, Lydia, you know, you project very well, you're a good communicator, would you consider uh, having a, a, a television show, a cooking show? And uh, I thought about it uh, uh, for a while. Of course I would. I mean, you know, uh, I, I wanted to communicate. I wanted to share, you know, what, what I was doing. Uh, so take it beyond the table of the restaurant, take it into books and then into television. Uh, I think that, uh, that that was my dream. But I had, I had two, two requests I said of him, to him. And I said, one, that we taped the show in my house and that we did, and the tape, the show, the actual cooking is still done in my house, and grandma lives upstairs, and that's why she comes down all the time. <laughs> and, and the second one is that I be on public television, because I think, you know, uh, um, I, I, I love uh, food, but uh, uh, in order for me to be creating what I do, I, I need art, I need music, and I think that uh, what, what public, television delivers to, to the living rooms and to the homes of people uh, is, is something that I wanted to be involved. And so it's been 12 years, and yes, I've been asked by different stations here and there, but I, I'm still committed, and here I am. And uh, this is a, a, a relationship, a joint uh, effort between you and I, because unless you are here, you call in, you support, you tell Lori what you want, uh, and you tell her that you want shows like mine, of course. Uh, <laughs> then, then, then uh, I, I wouldn't have an opportunity to maybe be on public television and continue to be on television. So I really thank you uh, for your support, for your for watching the show, for your continued support to public television because that guarantees that I will continue to air. So grazie. I'm set. I'm set. Okay. So I thought it would be fun to just go back a little bit, because I think a lot of people really don't know how rich and wonderful your background is. So let's talk a little bit. You grew up in Istria, and I think it would be interesting for people to hear about that. Yes, OK. So Istria is, if you're looking at Italy and you, the boot, and in the right-hand corner, there's a little appendage, a little peninsula. And now it's not Italy, but it used to be Italy, and that's called Istria. And in World War II, um, of course, Italy lost, was on the wrong side. 
And part of the spoils of war, that part of Istria and Dalmatia was given to Yugoslavia, and which Tito and communism came in. Mm -hmm. So we were caught, and this was uh, around 47, mm -hmm. in February of 1947. Uh, I was just born right on the cusp, so because there was an opportunity for ethnic Italians to go back to Italy before the Iron Curtain went up, went down. But I was just a baby and we stayed and we got caught behind the Iron Curtain and uh, we couldn't leave then. So uh, about 10 years thereafter, in 1956, my parents decided that they needed to go back to Italy because we couldn't speak Italian, we couldn't practice our religion. Mm -hmm. we, we, you know, my mother was an elementary school teacher. She, she had to uh, sort of take up the, 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 the Yugoslavian, whatever it was, uh, and, and uh, so it was very difficult. But they wouldn't let the whole family leave. So my mother, my brother, and myself left us tourists. Now, as a child, I didn't know that we were not going to go back. But my father ultimately escaped the border, and we caught up in Trieste, and then ultimately moved on to, to the United States. Can you talk a little bit about kind of, don't you always wonder kind of what were Lydia's earliest kind of childhood memories of food? Do you know what I mean? Because I just think kind of, what were the food memories? What are the things that you well, remember? I, I, uh, because of this situation, uh, uh, my mother, I spent a lot of time with my grandmother, maternal grandmother and grandfather, although my, my paternal grandparents were in the same town, so it was, uh, but uh, because in the city I, I couldn't, uh, of course, speak or go to church, my grandmother sort of snuck me into church and did all these things. But what, what was wonderful about it, I think, in those my formative years was that the setting was, she grew and had everything that we needed as far as food. We had chickens, goose, ducks, pigs, goats. We milked the goat. We made the sausages in this November. We, we made olive oil uh, in, in late, uh, late November. Then uh, the wine, we distilled the grappa. We dried the figs. We dried the beans. I went to harvest the potatoes. So uh, when, when at that young age, and you take a piece of still warm bread made in, in the brick oven with wood brick oven, oh. and you dunk it in the oil that's just running down, oh. those flavors uh, are, you can't forget. And that's part of my kind of reference library as far as flavors. I think that sort of guided my, my whole future. Mm. Let's talk a tiny bit about Trieste, because it was kind of two years mm -hmm. you, you ended up in a refugee camp, and it was two years before you actually ended up coming to America. Right, uh, so the America, the, the uh, my parents tried to settle in Italy because we were Italians and, and of course Italy accepted us and we had relatives in there. But it was difficult. It was difficult to find a job. Uh, we, we lived with a great aunt and you know, she, she sort of supported us. And, you know, it was, it was, my parents felt, well, maybe we should move on. And in order to do that, uh, we, had, we entered a, a political refugee camp, and we were there for two years, which sort of uh, left you in, in, in a situation uh, that, you know, you awaited for an opportunity because um, as Italians, you know, certainly America, America wasn't taking any refugees at that time from any, any uh, immigrants from any place. But uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower uh, made a special provision that political refugees, refugees escaping communism, were allowed to come in. Mm. And we were part of that waiting line. And for two years, we were in this, in the Campo San Saba, uh, which now is a museum in, in Trieste, and until our turn came. And ultimately, we were brought here by the Catholic Relief Services. And we didn't have anybody here, so they brought us here. They, they settled us. They found a little home. After, after about two months and work for my mom and dad, and ultimately we began to be Americans. When you came, now to say, because I mean, you always think, where do you come first? You, you actually ended up coming in, to, to New York, right? Isn't that, did you they, come first? We, we, yes, they put us in Walcott Hotel, this, uh, and uh, um, it was on 36th Street and uh, 7th Avenue. And we stayed there for about two months. So right in the middle, you know, for my brother and I, he's two years older to be in the middle of these big buildings. I mean, coming from a small town, it was just wonderful. My parents cried and cried and cried, but you know, we, we went out the, the two, and we were allowed to only go around the block. Oh. And, my, and my brother had to hold me by the hand. Oh. But uh, yeah, it was, it was uh, a, I mean, a tremendous experience.
experience oh. for us uh, uh, coming right in the middle uh, of New York. And then slowly they found a little home in New Jersey. And we stayed there for uh, about six months and job for my parents. And then a distant cousin found, uh, found us. He lived in Queens, so we came back in Astoria, and that's where our story begins. And you started working early on, didn't you? Cooking, actually, because your mom was cooking. I mean, your mom was working. Yeah, my mom was working late, so I was, she, she stayed, her job stayed in New Jersey, so to come across, took her, she would be home at seven o'clock at night, so she would set everything up and I would cook, finish the dinner, and I had a grand, grand time doing it. But also at, at, uh, at 14, uh, uh, I began working in, in a bakery, Walken's Bakery, actually, Christopher Walken, we are still friends. Isn't that so, fun? <laughs> I know. So his, his, uh, his, uh, his parents had Walken's Bakery, a German bakery, and I went there and I, because you know, I needed to supplement a little bit uh, a little money helped the family, and Saturday, um, Saturdays and Sundays, I worked part time. Uh, and I, uh, I told them I was 16. I was only 14 when I started. So, I, <laughs> but I was a big girl. So. We won't tell, right? <laughs> but yeah, we still remain. Then, then I brought my mother over, uh, and so she came to work, and that was close to home. And yeah, with with. Christopher Walken and his family, we remain friends. Actually, I just went to see him. He had to be handing in Spokane. He just, he'll be there until June. It was a great show, great show. So I have to ask, what was it like cooking for your mother? Because I can imagine that, I know. And do you no. have any memories of what you cooked for your mother? Oh, I, there was a lot of soups involved because yes. soups are kind of nutritional and, and there's, uh, you know, sort of, a, a, you, you can't burn them as much. So she would have the beans. <laughs> you, can't, you have the beans because I was doing my homework and cooking and setting the table and everything by the time she came home. Right. So uh, I remember, you know, she would soak the beans and whatever, and then she would leave step one, step two, step three, and I, I would make it happen and then sort of really got into it and uh, and I really enjoyed it and you know then 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 I graduated then I got fascinated by this cake mixes you know this American <laughs> this American cake mixes and I used to make in cupcakes and and regular cakes because it was fascinating that if you mix and you put an egg in there whatever the whole thing would come up you know and uh, so I did we had a lot of desserts <laughs> now let's see okay I know what we want to talk about, for Lydia. You know, one of the things that Lydia will not say about herself, but she really is, you know, the person who came to this country, saw this as a, a land of opportunity, and really seized that opportunity, and has many, many successful restaurants. But really, the flagship, which continues to go very, very strong, is Felidia. So, uh, right. My first restaurant was in 19. We opened in 1971, and it was in the suburbs, and it was called Bonavia. Now, I was 24. I had one child by then, and I was not a professional chef. I mean, even through college and all that, I worked in restaurants to help to to supplement my education, but uh, but uh, I was not so. When we opened, my husband, on the other hand, whom I met, he was in the business, and he always wanted to open the restaurant. So when we decided to, that I would help him, but I wasn't a chef, we hired an Italian-American chef. And for 10 years, I worked as the sous chef to this Italian-American chef until I, I, I really got the sort of the, 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 the professionalism of being a chef. But then right. I went back to school, and, and, and I began cooking my own little regional things. And in 1981, we opened Felidia. We sold those places. We opened Felidia in New York City, and then I became the chef. And I cooked uh, at that time uh, my, my, the, re the food of my region because that's what I knew. My region, Veneto, a few regions. I didn't know all of Italy because I hadn't traveled all of Italy, although we began going back every year to really uh, uh, um, adjourn myself in a sense. And uh, Felidia became, yes, yeah, sort of the, the mecca for the journalists, for Julia Child, as I said before, and all of that. All of these foodies, you know, who is this woman cooking? Uh, these, this very regional, strange Italian food, which was not the traditional Italian-American, but uh, regional Italian food. What was, if, what was the experience that you wanted people to take away from that restaurant? Because I know you, you had a vision. You had a, you had a strong uh -huh. vision. What did you want people to say, this is the experience I want them to have from well, this restaurant? Well, I wanted to be as close as I could to what really Italy is, the food in Italy, what I ate as a child, what we still ate at home. And uh, you know, Laurie, it wasn't that easy because if we go back to 1971, you couldn't even get some of the ingredients. 
And to transport a cuisine, what you really need is traditional ingredients and the technique. So what I wanted, I wanted them to really feel my region, feel the Italy that I knew, um, uh, the, the, the intensity of flavors, because, you know, they would, they would go a lot in traveling and says, you know, we come back here and the food is not the same as in Italy. And it is difficult to transport, even this, till this day, you know, I mean, I'm talking about, uh, 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 almost uh, 40, 40 years later, right. um, if it's difficult to have a 100% Italian restaurant when you transport it because just the elements are a little bit different. different. Mm. So I know for, for really everything that you do, it's all about the family. And I know that there came a point when you decided to kind of join forces with your son Mm -hmm. And uh, talk a little bit about that and the, and the restaurants that well, you opened working, yeah. working with him. Well, the kids, you know, grew up in the restaurant business uh, because, you know, as I said, I had Joseph. Tanya was born a year after we, we opened our first restaurant. And uh, it was kind of the family uh, support system. You know, my mother, uh, we lived, uh, uh, you know, upstairs and downstairs and she would help. So the kids would come to the restaurant. They would do the homework on tomato boxes, on this, on that, <laughs> and ultimately, ultimately go home with grandma, you know, eat and then go home with grandma. But you know, uh, we were very much into, into education. This is America and you know, all the opportunities were here. And uh, uh, you know, I told my children, I said, you know, no, you need, you're not gonna do this. This <laughs> might look interesting, might be fun, but you need to get your education and move on. And actually my son came to Boston College. He did, I think, political science. And, and philosophy, then went uh, as an analyst uh, down on Wall Street. Uh, and uh, my daughter, Tanya, uh, she, she did uh, what, Georgetown, and then ultimately ended up with a PhD from Oxford. So in, in Renaissance art history, and she helps me with the books and all of that. So, so they, they had their education, they're both working with me. <laughs> but, but, but they had their education. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, you know, one day my son just came over and he said, you know, he was down on Wall Street, I think, about, after, about five years after he was down there. And he said, uh, I think, you know, I want to I, I wanna change my job. And I says, why? He says, because I'm not really happy. And I says, what do you want to do? So he told me, he says, I want to hang around here. So, <laughs> I, I didn't know what that meant, but he's a serious guy. And um, the first thing, was, he went to Italy for a whole year and up and down Italy, then came back and just when added with a vengeance, the great uh, restaurateur and businessman, and uh, you had some of his wine, Bastianich wine, so I'm very proud of him, as and, I am of my daughter. Yeah, and talk about the vineyards. Where are the vineyards? Just the so vineyards people know. are, so we come from northeast, you know, uh, Istria is no longer Italy, but I do go back to Istria uh, 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 every time I visit. I have the grandparents' home. Now it's Croatia, it's democratic. So it's, it's, it's a democratic country, so I, I go there. But we have, we bought this uh, uh, place, I guess, he, in Friuli Venezia Giulia, which is the region uh, that borders now with Slovenia and Austria, and Trieste is the capital. Uh, and that's where uh, the, white, uh, the white wine is made, uh, mm. uh, the Bastianich winery is there. And we go there every summer with his kids. He has three kids, my daughter has two. So we go back often and get the children also to sense their roots. It's fabulous. So I just want to quickly just kind of go through public television too and mm -hmm. kind of the, the wonderful, mm -hmm. kind of, it's been 12 years that you've been on public television. Talk about just the very first television series that you did and kind of your vision for that. And I know there were books that went along the right. way. Right, so the, the, the first, uh, well I had, the first book was uh, La Cucina di Lidia and that was in 1990. And that came out of uh, Jay Jacobs, who, who wrote for the Gourmet magazine, right. uh, what lived across the street. He would always come and he said, Lydia, you know, you need to put these recipes down. And I said, Jay, but I'm, I'm not a writer. He says, I'll do it with you. So we, it's a collaboration. <laughs> and that, that was kind of the, the sort of loosening up of, of me being able to let out information and put it down. Uh, and, and then after that uh, came Lydia's Italian American Kitchen, and that was the first series. And that book was based on the Italian, because as I told you, I apprenticed with my chef who was Italian American. Right. And for me, that was almost a new cuisine, learning, you know, that food of Italian American is not something that I cooked at home or that we ate. The, the underlying philosophy and the, and the you know, and the, the elements, tomatoes and oil and all of that were there. But, but so, so 10 years being alongside with him, 
I really learned that cuisine. But in this book and in the series that went beyond, I really researched what made the Italian cuisine difference, different and what, where does it belong in Italy. And actually, the Italian-American cuisine is a cuisine of adaptation. When those early immigrants came, they didn't have their products. They adopted what they remembered, the recipes, the memory, to the products that they found. Um, you know, for example, the tomato. The tomato is, is, a, a, is a new world product. It came right. to, to, to Italy after. But uh, the Italy somehow, in, in Italy they somehow uh, profess that in the sense that you get that, that San Marzano tomato, right. or whatever. so it's sweet and it's low in, in, se in seeds, in pits. Uh, here you have the beautiful, at least when they came, the, the, the big tomatoes, which, which had a lot of acidity and, and some seeds, which uh, the seeds have tannins and they make the sauce bitter. So the addition of a lot of garlic, the addition of sugar, which didn't happen in Italy. So the Italian-American cuisine, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary cuisine of an adaptation of, of a people coming to a, a, a country and doing what they found. So actually, I feel that that's part of the Americana story. So let's talk about kind of what the evolution that came to Lydia's Italy, that led to Lydia's Italy, and we're now actually starting Lydia's Italy 4 soon, exactly. but, but kind of talk a little bit about that. Well, from there then I went to Lydia's Italy, that was the next, and we did 26 episodes, <gasps> right. and uh, um, uh, 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 no, there was Lydia's it Italian, uh, no, uh, I know we have to remember, <laughs> there have been so many. Okay. I know go, back. <laughs> uh, go back, go back. Go back a little, but anyway, so uh, so that was Italy, just the cuisine of Italy, right. and, and I did it all in, in from my from the studio, meaning my kitchen. Right. The one that follow, I said, okay, so what am I going to share? Because I was getting great responses uh, from all of you and emails, and you wanted to know, you wanted to know more, the questions about my family, and and the the question of my family is is the reality. You know, this is what we do, this is what we are. Grandma lives upstairs, my kids, and we really <laughs> we really do these 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 things. So all the recipes, and that was was a great series and a great book. And then I said, okay, now I have to take you to Italy. So Lydia's Italy and Lydia Cooks from the Heart of Italy are, it's, it's uh, 50, 156, 112, 112 episodes with two books wow. that ran across uh, uh, four years, yeah. right? And, and this addresses all 20 regions of Italy. Uh, Italy has 20 regions, so in Lydia's Italy you have 10 regions. And in Lydia's, Lydia Cooks from the Heart of Italy, you have the other 10 regions. In Lydia's Italy, I inserted Istria, which is not a region of Italy, but just because I came from there, <laughs> I, I had to, I had to, you know, because where, where's the genesis? Where was I born? I had to do that. And I think this book is, is really wonderful because it addresses, Lydia Cooks from the Heart of Italy, it addresses the less known regions of Italy, like uh, Calabria, Basilicata, uh, Sardinia. So a lot of people, because some of the first immigrants that came from Italy were from Calabria, from Sicily, from Basilicata. So a lot of the recipes, a lot of people say, oh, finally, Calabria, Calabrese, you have my, the recipes of my heritage. Right. So, um, and we are up to the present. Yes. So do we want to talk, I think we're supposed to talk about the kids' books first, or should we do, yes, let's talk about, because this is really nice. You, Lydia has been inspired to write a wonderful children's book, and I think, just as, again, this is a nice preview, it's coming out in October, but tell everybody yes, about September. it, because it's quite special. <laughs> it's it's Nona, Nona Tell Me a Story. So at our house, you know, when the kids come, uh, um, after we're finished eating or whatever, we, we kind of, my bed is the bed. We all pile up in the bed. <laughs> and not, and then they, they sort of uh, kind of count who's going to sleep with me because, you know, uh, <laughs> they take turns. And uh, so Nona tell me a story. And the, the stories that they love most is the story of my childhood. You know, when I grew up in the setting of, of uh, you know, milking the goats and when the new new kit was born, the new goat, baby goat was born. Mm -hmm. And we, we I used to tie a red ribbon and we used to kind of, play with them uh, when I used to go gather the, the warm eggs uh, from the chicken or from, from the duck. And uh, the story always, I had this mean duck. She always laid the eggs someplace else. <laughs> and, and I had to go and find it. But then she would come and peck me. <laughs> she would, but I had a stick. So, <laughs> so, so they love these stories. So I said, you know, and, and it was around Christmas time, I think. This, this happened, this book was written about four or five years ago, actually, and then slowly came to, 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 to life. But uh, 
a Christmas tree, you know, when I was little, we didn't have all these ornaments. And uh, the tree that we did, we usually didn't take the top of a tree, kill the tree for a Christmas tree. We usually took a bush, a juniper bush or something like that, and we would decorate it. And we would put on it apples or oranges and all kinds of nuts, all the things that were kind of reserved in the cantina that they would save the fruit, uh, dried figs, we would make wreaths uh, with, uh, uh, with bay leaves and, and sort of turn it around. Uh, we baked lots of cookies and we made uh, candies and whatever, and all of this wrapped and all this became the Christmas tree. So we called it the edible Christmas tree. So this is the story that I tell here to my grandchildren how I did it and ultimately, you know, the kids say, can we do a Christmas tree like that? And we do. Uh, we decorate the Christmas tree like that, and I give the recipes of the of the of the cookies uh, that we baked and all of that. So it's 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 a Christmas tree story, how to make that edible Christmas tree, if you will. And we we didn't have gifts, and I tell them, you know, for us the epiphany, the sixth day of of January was the big day where you finally ate the tree. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 no no we we snuck in there before we used to. We used to we used to unravel the candy, eat the candy, and put a pebble in there. <laughs> and I think one of the very nice things, which Lydia, actually, we were talking about it yesterday. One of the things, not only in passing on kind of the stories, the very personal traditions and the history, was also just to kind of encourage people again to spend time with their kids, to read with their kids. Uh, yeah, I think you know it's. Um, it, the world is going just too fast for children, I think, today, and there's no better place to, to sort of come, make it all come to a halt than, than the table uh, and working with them in the kitchen, and there's such reward. Uh, but the, the table is, and I get a lot of comments from all of you, the viewers, and the one that I get most is, Lydia, you made me come back to the table, the, the importance of the table. And I'm so, so, I feel so wonderful that if I am instrumental in what I do, you allow me to come in your homes and I appreciate that very much and I take that very seriously and personally. But if I can sort of uh, um, just uh, stimulate the idea of getting back to the table with the family, with the kids, uh, then, you know, maybe uh, it's, it's, it's a great satisfaction for me. It's fabulous. Isn't that great? And you have a plan too. So this is not. This is the first of many. You're going to talk about that wicked, wicked duck, right? <laughs> or, the, or, the, or, the, or the goose? What the, the duck? goose? The goose. goose. The goose. Yeah, yes, yeah. right. I, li the eggs, I right? liked her roasted the best. You did. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I give you a recipe. One of these books. <laughs> and that's the that's the goose in mine. <laughs> uh, are you going to see one of my restaurants in Boston? Um, uh, I think I think you're well supplied with restaurants. I <laughs> no, not mine. But I, uh, you know, I it's it's uh, I I don't know if my son or whatever. I really now sort of defer to if they want to grow. And a lot of the growth that we had in Kansas City and Pittsburgh is because uh, of him and wanting to grow. So I, you know, I'm there when when and and how they need me. Uh, but I'm not going to initiate any restaurant. But just just to let you know, I was this morning, as I said, up in the North End. In less than a square mile, you have 103 Italian restaurants. Wow, that's unbelievable. Where did you eat when you were there? You know, I was there this morning, so I didn't have lunch. But let me tell you, it was raining. We had a lot of coffee. We had coffee and Maria's. We had uh, coffee and Spogliatella Maria. We had. Uh, uh, Coffee, cappuccino at uh, the Modern. Uh, then we went to the to the Salumeria. We had a little nibble of a sandwich. So I mean, we were we were all over, but we were early in the morning. We were out there already. I mean, some of the stores weren't even open. It was great. It was really wonderful. What is your connection to uh, Pittsburgh and Kansas City? <clears throat> well, those are the restaurants that when my son came on board and uh, the first restaurant that we opened together was Beko, that's on 46th Street in, in the theater district. And that was a big success. And then <clears throat> he wanted to expand, you know, um, he's born in America, he's an American, he felt m uh, mom, maybe middle America, uh, they're underserviced in our product and let's try that. So Kansas City and Pittsburgh came. And, and also, um, uh, I think the third restaurant uh, 
Mari Batali and us, we are partners in all of the restaurants. So then Babo came and so mm -hmm. on uh, with, with my son and Mario and so on. It's a seasonal food question about Easter and Italians. Have you ever made Italian meatloaf? Yes. You have. How, did, how have you made it? Oh, I made it. I make it many different ways. In this, in <clears throat> in, in in this book, uh, I have it with where I put uh, ricotta in it. Have you ever tried with ricotta? Ah. And that's from Le Marche, and it makes it so delicious and moist. So you know the the onions, the the, the yes. Tell me. Uh, the egg in the center. Yeah. Yeah, the egg in the center is, you put the boiled egg in the center, yeah. But there's many different ways. I think, you know, the question is on, on everybody wants a nice, moist, and tasty. Uh, I just tested some for the next book, uh, and uh, uh, where I do a pistata of celery, carrots, and onions. And then I soak the bread in milk, you know, all bread in milk and all of that. And then, of course, dry oregano and salt and pepper and cheese and parsley and 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 the eggs in the center yes thank you hello hi <laughs> i was wondering um i know felidia has been there a long time and i love felidia and it's one of my favorite restaurants and our wine director came and was your wine director david weizenhofer yeah. i wondered how much you're there how much you enjoy still being in the restaurant um whether you're involved in the daily operations or whether you leave that, that to other people now and and whether you miss it if you can't with all the wonderful things that you're doing for public television uh, yes, I, I, I really need to enjoy what I do, otherwise I, I just can't do it. So I really enjoy being in a restaurant, not as much on the line as I was. I think that my role now has become more of a mentor, and it's a great role because I think, you know, through the years uh, and from, from 71 till certainly many years, you take in, you know, you learn, you, you, you mature, you grow, you develop who you are as a professional. And then you're at the peak and you really do your thing. And then this, you have to give some of this back. And I think the great satisfaction now is in, even though there are restaurants, these young chefs that come along and I collaborate with them. And how can one have so many restaurants, one asks, you know, and it's it, because not the restaurants are not, I don't impose my taste or my, otherwise I would have to be there. What I do is that I take the talent that this individual has and we work together. So, so you know, it's almost like, like physics. If, if, if you give me inertia, it's very hard for me to get a star. I have to give all my energy. But if you give me energy, then it's easy for me to move it. So when you get these young chefs uh, full of energy, full of want and whatever, and you have to give them room to create. You just mentor them, you're there with them. We, we take trips to Italy, uh, we go out to restaurants and eat, and, and my, my, my great satisfaction of the restaurants are, of course, walking them and, and greeting the people once, you know, everything is in motion. Uh, still that hospitality element. Mm -hmm. uh, behind the house is really mentoring and working with the young people. Uh, the, the question is that uh, uh, a lot of Italian people coming from Italy have, have told him that Italian food in America is like Italian food decades ago that they ate. Um, if you're talking about Italian-American food, it doesn't exist in Italy. You don't eat. If you talk about meatballs, spaghetti and meatball is not something, unless it's trying to please the, the, the thing. It's the little, the little meatballs in the lasagna, yes, in Naples you have. You have the, the, the soup with maritata with meatballs in there. You have the polpette, which are meatballs which are fried and you eat them like that. Uh, so so it's, it's, uh, in Italy, this, the cuisine of Italian-American is not the, the cuisine. What was eaten uh, uh, decades ago, and if I remember the cuisine of, of my, it was a cuisine that was maybe more based on animal fat and, you know, much more, but that everybody has enlightened, you know, that's a natural progression of, of our needs. I mean, one needs to, 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 to evolve that. Uh, but the, the cuisine, a major, major change, I mean, they eat lighter, yes, uh, you know. But the ratio of, if you talk about vegetables and starches and all of that, maybe because uh, also of necessity, I remember eating a lot more vegetables and, and polenta and, and pasta than I ever did meat. Now, and the meat uh, that, that, was, that was used was prepared in such way, you know, not, not big steaks or whatever, it was never, it was, the animal was rarely slaughtered just 
to enjoy it, like, you know, the prime meat or the Kobe beef or whatever. It serviced, uh, and then it was slaughtered, and then it, the meat was tough, so it was cooked in longer cooking techniques, mm -hmm. braising and whatever. And a little meat gave a lot of flavor, cooked a long time, and went uh, a long way, so it was like a flavoring agent. And within my restaurants, and, you know, uh, more than 30 years of running restaurants, uh, I, I tried forever to, to mm, the ratio of proteins to the vegetables and the carbohydrates in a plate, you know. Um, in, in America still, the dominant has to be the protein, you know. That, I guess that delineates value. The protein is what you pay for. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's, I mean, it's, you know, it's two thirds of protein and one third of everything else versus, you know, the meals that I can remember and uh, that I have, it's the other way around. It's one third of proteins and maybe two thirds of, of the rest. So, um, you know, if they're talking about Italian American cuisine, that's completely different. Uh, but the other elements I think is more nutritional that changed. I have a lot of friends here, you know. <laughs> so, but I am, I am uh, staying at the Charles and uh, Rialto is there, a great, yes. a great restaurant. Yes. Uh, and she's a dear friend, so that's a good restaurant, and I think that's where I'm gonna eat since I'm right there. <laughs> oh, okay, if I'm to send young chefs uh, to Italy for the experience, what regions are not to be missed? Mm -hmm. Now, there's 20 regions, and I can tell you, and I can tell you that each one of them has its gems in food. A lot of it are based on, on seasonality. You know, if you go to you tell me in the fall and whatever, you know, certainly Piemonte, Lombardia, the risotto, the soups, the truffles, uh, uh, Trentino, you know, uh, the, the, the north really excels in, in those winter, uh, winter dishes. You talked to me about uh, uh, eggplant and tomatoes, Sicily in July and August. You talked to me about chicories and, and uh, dry pasta and all of that, uh, spring into summer in mm -hmm. Puglia, which is the heel. So, you know, talk to me about fresh tomatoes and pizzas and all of that, Rome and Naples. Oh. So, you know, it's all different. Uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, pasta making, Emilia Romagna, Bologna, absolutely. It's, it's I mean, that's pasta. I mean, uh, the flag might as well be a sheet of pasta. <laughs> <laughs> I get asked a lot of time to advise them on what they what they should do as as chef, uh, you know, to to pursue the career of a chef. Uh, I think you know. I tell them first of all, you finish your college, and in college, uh, choose something that you love mm -hmm. and major. Whether it's music, whether it's art, whether it's whatever you, whether it's architecture, whatever. Focus on that. Get a good basic education, and begin to dabble in in the cooking and and working. Then go on to culinary school. You need some, you know, the real professional. Culin then, and again, always experience, always working with different people. It's, it's just like working with different mentors. You have to experience in order to collect what you want out of them. And then traveling is a must. If you're going to uh, cook a cuisine, uh, uh, and you know, sometimes young people are confused, but whether it's Fran France, uh, French food, or whether it's Spanish, or whether it's Italian, you must live it. You must taste it in situ. Otherwise, you will just never know what, what so. And uh, you know, that sometimes is difficult for, for a, lot of, a lot of youngsters. But there are opportunities, you know, whether you work on ships and you travel, whether you work for hotels. And a lot of the restaurants I know in Italy, we do exchange. We, we've, Set, set young people up. Uh, they work, you know, they're not paid or anything, and they have to be able to, 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 be able to do that. Mm -hmm. But it's invaluable an experience abroad, living, shopping uh, with the culture. It, it seems that that, that is uh, uh, the case, and I think it's because of the trans fats also, you know, the use of olive oil, uh, the vegetables. Uh, I, I think, you know, a lot of uh, legumes, a lot of uh, uh, all of that, maybe more balance. And if you eat seasonally, you will balance it that way because in the wintertime, you know, short of, of, of cabbage or whatever vegetable you have preserved or dry, or whatever, the legumes are left, you know, and you just eat, and they're at the basis of everything, you know, whether it's lentils, whether it's dried favas, whether it's, you know, and, and those are used a lot. So I think that uh, just living with, within the climate and seasonally really dictates. Lydia, is, um, 
Italy's approach to cuisine at all threatened by the internationalization of fast food nation and supersize me and frozen foods and eat and run? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> That it is it, in other parts of the world. It, it is as 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 uh, as the rest of the world is. Certainly, it's a big industry, you know, and the and the and the money uh, element factor. Uh, but the one good thing, uh, the Italians are not so ready to give up their flavor, their, their products. You know, an Italian needs his Grana Padano, his Parmigiano Reggiano, his prosciutto, <laughs> and, and just will not settle for anything else. And there's, there's, there's no way. Uh, and I think maybe, you know, um, one, one wonders, you know, why is the life, the Italian lifestyle, I wonder myself, you know, sometimes, why is the, the Italian lifestyle so so admirable i mean right. so by 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 many and and the food and the art and the music and um uh, i i think because uh italians are very individualistic if you will you know very family uh oriented but they're they're not uh uh, uh Italy was only unified about 150 years ago. So they don't follow mass philosophy or mass whatever. And within that context, you know, all of that is very important. And they have, there's more time, I think, to concentrate for, for the good and for the, uh, for, the, for the bad on oneself, on the, on the intimacy and maybe the creativity and all of that. Uh, uh, regions 20. Dialects more than twenty, uh, folks, folk songs. Mm -hmm. You you know, I mean, and uh, yeah. you talk about a, maybe a, a, something as, as basic as a pasta fagioli, 20, 20 kilometers away. It's mine is better than yours, and so 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 <laughs> it's, it's 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 the beauty of it. It's like it's like a mosaic, you know. If you go to the mosaics of Ravenna, you know all those little dots. Uh, uh, but I think that's why you know if if it, it would be difficult to to the Italians, um, and they they cook. Uh, you know, I mean it's less. The problems are getting there. I when I go to Italy, I check the the stores, the, the the supermarkets, and see what's 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 frozen and what what is prepared food. Uh, there's there's not as much, uh, thank God. But there are some of the the baked goods, which has the trans fats and all of that. I think the one thing that they're really fighting back and it was dangerous of is the European Union, where where the products, you know, now everything can try, and where Denmark was beginning to 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 uh, to produce uh, Parmigiano. I mean, the Italian says this is sacrilegious. No, no way. And and so and so they really began to 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 fight back and to put the DOP, the DOCG. The origine controllata, really, like you know, champagne does for champagne. It's only in champagne, and so on. Uh, so I think that's going to be a saving, saving grace. But yeah, there was there was a period where you, where you know, you kind of felt that it's all going to be Europe was going to be all homogenized in a will, but I don't think it will. All right. Now we can't take any more questions, but I do have. I can't. I feel compelled to ask this: the perfect pasta to salt or not to salt, to oil, and do you put water on the pasta after you've poured it out in the colander? <laughs> okay, right, don't so you want to know? Salting, right? <laughs> salting is a, it's a question of personal. I think you need to salt the water uh, because once you have cooked the pasta, to, to, to permeate the salt in the pasta is very difficult. So mm -hmm. it will always be kind of a little bit flat. But if you have restrictions, then that's an, you know, or, or if you're used to less, it's different thresholds that we all have for sour, sweet, saltiness. So that's a personal matter. Um, you, to, the water, when you, when you drain the pasta, you always save a little bit of water. So right. what I think you're alluding to is that I save the water and I recommend that because when you're cooking and you're mis mixing the pasta with the sauce, you know, right. I always recommend that. Right. You want to cook a little bit and then you finish cooking it right. in the sauce. And if, if you, you know, you run out of sauce because maybe somebody's not at the table, maybe the pasta was too undercooked and whatever, that water saves you. You don't always look for butter or for fats or for, right. or for stock or whatever, you know, that water just can be used and you don't want to smother it with sauce either right. you know so so using the water always save a little bit and using it in that fashion absolutely great good all right okay. yes that was very good so what do you say